We, uh, my name is Brad Hill, and I'm a, uh, excited to be joined by my good friend Brian Gill, and we are both uh, just incredibly encouraged to be joined uh, today by Ben King, uh, professional cyclist and wildlife photographer, which is uh, something I'm excited to hear a little bit more about. Uh, Virginia native, Virginia born, but now lives in Italy with his, uh, with his wife and his newborn son, which I hope maybe we'll hear some more about that, about that adventure, because that is an adventure. Uh, in and of itself but man ben we're so thankful you've taken time to to join us out of uh, your schedule man yeah absolutely appreciate you guys reaching out i think uh i mean I'm, I'm just really excited about the the theme of this podcast and um encouraging people to get outdoors and enjoy creation and um i mean that, that's what i'm all about both in uh, cycling and photography which i mean you call me a wildlife photographer that's <laughs> that's a hobby um but it's something i've really been enjoying lately so sure yeah uh, either way um you know nature and the outdoors is um how i've been able to connect uh, most freely with god and um that's my it's a very spiritual time for me to be being outside so um i, I really appreciate the theme of, of your guys podcast and, yeah um encouraging other people toward that space yeah man we um you know ben it, it, funny story the uh a few years ago I was, we were, we were planning a ride and, um, to honor my late father. And, um, I found out that one of my college friends who his name is also Ben King, he, uh, he, he was into cycling. And so I was like, well, let me look him up on Strava. And so I looked him up on Strava and I found your, your, you know, your profile. And I was thinking, good grief. He is really into (laughs) cycling lately. I mean, he has really gotten into cycling. And so I talked to my friend Tom and I said, Tom, I didn't know that Ben was such a cyclist. He's like, there's a professional cyclist named Ben King. That's like, <laughs> oh, that's that's what it is. So like oh, that's kind of how I was introduced to you. And I started thinking, my goodness. And then you know, Brad sent me uh some of your wildlife photography. And I was like, this guy, this guy's our people. I mean, the, with the yeah. photography, with the, the creative writing, with all these things, I'm like, man, this, uh, this guy's a, uh, he's one that we would love to talk to. So thank you for joining us. And, and also, you know, when you ever don't, uh, I don't want our listeners to, to miss here. When, when we say wildlife photographer, I mean, Ben is a phenomenal photographer yeah. i mean it is a uh this is a he has really got a talent here and i hope you guys will check out some of his stuff but um man yeah we definitely have, I have that linked in the show notes because i really enjoyed seeing uh seeing all those pictures man they're really great well thank you yeah i mean i started a i started a step separate instagram account to start sharing uh that the wildlife photography because i mean part of uh being a professional athlete is um you know, our, our social media presence and promoting sponsors and everything. And I was afraid that my feed was just going to turn into a bunch of birds um, <laughs> and, and kind of upset my employers. So um, I started a separate account where I could just share the things that I enjoyed. No pressure. Sure. Um, just uh, get out there and try to find stuff that, that made me happier, or had a story behind it and uh, share that with other people. Yeah, man. Years ago, I got into cycling just as a hobby to to get myself, um, you know, in better shape, and uh, I, you know, I really enjoyed it. And I ended up getting into triathlon, and then that progressed and ended up doing Ironman and surviving an Ironman. And so, after all of that, or my limited time in the saddle, uh, I became um, I became a cycling fan and watching, you know, watching the races. The, the classics and then watching the sun, you know, it's a great to have a summertime sport as a, we both live in Alabama. So in the, in the fall, it's usually football. Um, but having mm-hmm. a summer, having a summer sport to, to really dial into, I, I've really enjoyed watching cycling. So as a fan, there's lots of questions I would like to ask when it comes to cycling, just because like my limited time in the saddle gives me a deep appreciation for what you guys do on a regular basis, because I understand briefly like how difficult it is that you know what you guys accomplish but then you have so many shared interests uh, too when it comes to the outdoors uh i mean i think i've seen over the years you're into hunting um and then it, and then now this new feed with with uh with the pictures and man just capturing 
the creativity because no, there's not much that shows the inc- intricacies of God's creation quite like uh, the various bird species that are out there. And so I'm growing a deeper appreciation for the beauty that is in, in all the different species of birds. And one of your one of our favorite, mine and Brian's favorite bird is the kingfisher. Man, you have some really beautiful <laughs> pictures of the kingfisher. Nice. Yeah, I appreciate that that poem that you shared with me earlier in the week. Oh man, what a great, what a great man, my favorite. So, so many ways this could go, and so many things that we could talk about and ask. But really, uh, what are we want to know? What what is something that that you would like to to share when it comes to the way we shape this podcast? Is obviously uh, somewhere between uh, is a very vague, uh, very vague shaping somewhere between Lewis and Tolkien and Lewis and Clark. And and really finding clarity in the stories we tell in these adventures. So you have you've had plenty of adventures over your years, but what are some that may or may maybe not be uh, the most visible ones or, or things that your personal experiences outdoors that have really brought you some clarity, maybe brought you through some dark times or or shaped you or changed you, which I'm sure cycling has been a big part of that, but it doesn't have to be all about cycling, I guess is what I was trying to say, is it could be whatever whatever outdoor activity is really, you know, a story that shaped you. Yeah. I mean, I wouldn't necessarily even say that there is one overarching story. It's just Mm, kind of a theme of my life. Um, And if any of your listeners are unfamiliar with the sport of cycling, like you said, now is the best time to start following it because um, opening weekend was last weekend of Mm -hmm. the Belgian classics. Um, and these are the most fun races to watch. Um, they are absolutely horrible to compete in. Um, <laughs> but, but in terms of a spectator, like these, these are the most fun engaging races to watch from now, um, mm-hmm. basically till the end of May and that, or the end of April, the Ardennes classics. Um, you know, I'm, I'm reminded like yesterday there was an under 23 race, a, a pretty high level under 23, like development race here in Luca. And I was out doing my training and, um, bumped into the course and got to see them come by. And, um, just like as a fan of the sport, as well as a competitor, I'm, you know, when, when I see it from the outside as a spectator, I'm just reminded how, like, you know, I see these guys whiz by and I'm like, Whoa, that is awesome like do i look like that do i look that cool when i come flying by like it's it's just amazing it's so beautiful and powerful and um just there's there's really nothing that compares to it um i mean my my wife she grew up on on baseball and football and mainstream american sports um she worked for nbc sports as a reporter and was hired or I guess assigned in 2015 to cover the Tour de France as a reporter, Um, knew nothing about cycling and went to France to cover the Tour de France and absolutely fell in love with it. And um, still, you know, still is a huge cycling fan and and kind of lost some of her interest, I guess, in, uh, in baseball and football hasn't been following the sports as closely anymore, but, um, you know, cycling is a special sport. It's there's so much history. Um, uh, you know, so many ethics and um, etiquette, I guess you could say, um, to how to how we ride together in a bunch at such high speeds. You know, so close together without um, mass pileups all the time, and certainly crashes do happen. Um, but they're not supposed to be part of the part of the game. Um, so yeah, it's just it's a it's a really cool sport, uh, you know, as a fan, especially this time of year with all these amazing one day races. Because you know everybody knows the Tour de France, but um, you know, these these monuments of the sport, uh, Flanders and Roubaix, are Roubaix is probably my favorite personal favorite. Yeah, some of the watch. worst races. To watch. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Some of the worst races to actually do, but. The coolest to watch. The slow motion of uh, those guys going over the cobblestones is like, it's so jarring. Like, I can't. Yeah. I cringe every time I hit a bump and I think, boy, that's nothing compared to what those guys go through. Yeah, I got I got thrown into Perry roubaix my first year as a professional, um, which is, you know, 
not a common thing to have happen, but um, I was second or third reserve for the race, but I had one teammate break his collarbone and another teammate with a knee injury. And I was in Belgian racing other races at the time. So they, they threw me in Peru Bay um, and wow. I finished and I never want to, or need to do it again. <laughs> <laughs> Mic drop. Um, so, so, yeah. And I don't think that was, you know, I kind of got off on a tangent there already. Um, but yeah, I guess, yeah, you lead the conversation and let's let it flow freely. And I'm sure stories will, will pop yeah. up. So Ben, um, yeah, you, you do something professionally that a lot of people do for fun and, 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 um, you know, thinking about, you know, riding a bike, that's a lot of people's first taste of independence you know, as a child. Um, my son getting to go to the next stop sign is, is a big deal for a six year old, um, yeah. you know, and going as fast as he can and just, you know, a single gear bike uh, is, is just like a, a race car whenever you're that age. Um, do you still have that as a professional riding a uh, bicycle? I mean, is it, or does it, has it changed as an adult and as a, as an occupation and as a, um, a professional athlete, do you still have that uh, childlike thrill? Yeah. And it's something that I've, you know, occasionally have to remind myself to, to tap into that kind of, uh, almost childlike curiosity and excitement about, um, you know, planning a big adventure, um, and going out exploring and, um, exploring not only my surroundings, but my own personal limits and kind of doing things that, that scare me a little bit, planning a training ride that that's a bit intimidating and, and just attacking it. Um, cause it's easy to get, to get sucked into the, you know, the monotony of, you know, doing your efforts and coming back and you just get into such a routine and it's exhausting. You find yourself very tired. Um, I think one of the keys to, um, the longe longevity of my career has been, uh, to maintain that, um, that mentality of, um, I guess, curiosity and, uh, exploration, um, remembering the things that hooked me initially to the sport of cycling, um, to keep myself engaged and keep myself um, growing and moving forward um, instead of just kind of getting stuck in the same place. Um, Cause I remember, you know, I could ride a bike before I could drive a car and I could, you know, I could ride from my parents' house into town uh, to meet a you know, to over to a friend. It was an hour, you know, 20 mile ride into town before I had my driver's license. I could jump on my bike and ride over to a friend's house, yeah. hang out for a couple hours and ride home. Um, so it was, yeah, it was definitely a, a sense of freedom and not only that, but I could get on my mountain bike and go explore the trails. You know, there's a, a lumber company owns the property bordering my parents and I could just get up there on all the, the double track trails and mm -hmm. just get lost in the mountains and learn about the places I was. And, um, you know, there's, there's definitely, uh, primitive satisfaction to conquering a mountain climbing up you know the, the biggest tallest mountain around you and you know we live uh close to the blue ridge mountains so um you know going to these climbs and getting to the top it still gives me a, a very primitive satisfaction mm. is there has there been a, a time when like you've been on one of these races in europe and you were able to kind of glance just for a second out of the Peloton, out of concentration and see the beauty of this. Cause that's probably one of the draws to watching some of these races is that are the aerial views of these magnificent places that you guys get to ride through in these various races. Yeah, I try to. Um, and that, I'm sure that's those, hard. <laughs> those, yeah, it's, you don't always have the opportunity cause a lot of times you're just slobbering over your handlebars or crying on it. And staring <laughs> at it. <laughs> Um, but, but occasionally there's an opportunity to, to look around and, um, it's almost an out of body experience because like I said, you know, I grew up a fan of the sport and I would watch these races on TV and see the, the spectacular aerial shots of the landscapes. Um, and then, you know, when I have an opportunity in one of these races to look around and I feel like I'm, I'm watching myself, 
Um, and it's, yeah, it's, it's surreal. Um, cause I think what I was getting at when I started talking about the freedom that I enjoyed when I was 16, 17 years old, getting to ride to a friend's house and explore the mountains around my house. Um, I've been blessed so much with, you know, the opportunity and ability to now be traveling the world. So, you know, even if it's not on a bike, like cycling has brought me to, I don't even know how many different countries now. Um, and I've gotten to appreciate the landscape in a way that a lot of people can only dream of by racing over it. Mm -hmm. You, um, on your, on your website, you mentioned that your favorite class in college was a creative writing class. Uh, is that something that you still are interested in? And, and is that a way of reflection for you? Or, or how, do, how does that play into your, to your life? And, 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 and maybe even how does that play into your faith? Is, is, does it come through in your creative writing? Yeah, I, I used to do a lot more writing. Um, I was, I was freelancing for some magazines and, uh, I, you know, I enjoyed writing for, you know, it wasn't always cycling magazines. I've been published in Buckmaster magazine and Rocky mountain up federation bugle magazine. And nice. <laughs> nice. That's awesome. A few different random, uh, you know, outdoors publications, but also the cycling magazines. Um, I, I especially appreciated getting pitched, uh, you know, a theme where I could take it kind of where I wanted um, right now, pretty much the only writing I've done recently is, uh, maintaining my, my website, the race reports. Um, I have a race report from every race, every stage of every race that I've done since, uh, I think 2009, mm -hmm. which is pretty cool. So one day when I'm, when I retire, I'm going to publish a little coffee table book or something. Is that, so when you write those reports, is that, is there opportunity in those for, you know, do you reflect and go, what are, what are things that I, that I learned, you know, in those, in those reports, or is it just like, here's what, here's what happened, you know, in the race? Yeah, it is. It, it is kind of a debrief for me. Um, you know, I kind of have to be honest with myself and it, these race reports started, um, in 2009, because, you know, I'm traveling in places where I don't have cell service. I can't call home all the time. Mm -hmm. um, and people were asking about what was going on in the races. So I just started sending out these email reports to, you know, my dad, my uncle, and a few, you know, a few other people. Um, just kind of a play by play. And that people just kept asking to be added to that, that list or to the point that, um, that, Outlook on, on my computer has a, apparently has a limit to how many email addresses you can add because uh, it was going out to over 200 people, I think, at, at one point. Um, you know, I had college professors asking to be added and just a whole bunch of people. And I wanted to send the emails in a place. Uh, it kind of felt like a safe place. It wasn't going on the Internet. Um, mm. Just as I said something negative about a sponsor or someone else in the race. Um, but I got, you know, eventually other people were publishing my emails on their own websites. So I was like, all right, well, I just well just post this on the internet. Um, so now I, you know, I've, I've kind of backdated a couple of them and I've been posting the more recent ones up on that, on my website. Um, and we'll continue to do that. Um, there have definitely been times when I don't want to write a race report at all. Um, the only thing that keeps me going sometimes is the fact that I haven't missed a race since 2009. So no. uh, that's some, um, can't break the, you can't break the streak, man. No, I can't break the streak. Not now. I'm, I'm in too deep. Um, but yeah, it is, you know, I, I try to keep it pretty honest, pretty open. Um, if I'm disappointed with the way I raced, I'm, you know, I'm not going to sugarcoat it to, you know, and manipulate it in a way that makes me look better than I felt um, to, you know, to anyone who might be watching. And, and that's kind of hard to uh, hard. player or future sponsor or whatever. So yeah. I try to 
keep it real. That's so good to, to be so transparent like that. And, you know, I think that sometimes, I don't know, I think we all may have a tendency to, to lean towards what we put on the internet to be the most perfect view of ourself and, and, <laughs> you know, hide all the warts, you know, but um, curate, we yeah, curate, put the best out there. That's it. Yeah. So. Well, one way that it's been valuable to me is, is that I'm able to look back um, at periods where I really struggled and felt terrible. And I can go back and reread these race reports and remember how, awful I felt in the races, um, how hopeless I felt, um, borderline depressed about my performance. And, you know, you, you can't in a time like that, you can't see the light at the end of the tunnel. Mm. Um, so I can go back and, and reread those race reports and see how, you know, sometimes in as little as two weeks, I turned a corner and was enjoying some of the best form of my life. Wow. Um, sometimes it took longer than two weeks. Sometimes it was months and, um, before I turned the corner, but it's all, you know, it's a good reminder. This sport is just so up and down. The highs are extremely high and the lows are extremely low. Um, for, you know, for most of us, there are very few of the superstars who kind of have found a way to stay at the top. Um, but Cycling is a sport where even the best riders in the world lose more than they win. Mm. It's not a, you know, a team sense in a sport that a team sport in the sense that, um, you know, there's one team against another team and one team wins and one team loses. Mm. Cycling is a team sport for sure. Um, you know, you're, you may only have one rider that crosses the line first, but you have eight riders supporting him to the finish line um, that made that victory possible. Um, but there are 21 teams in the race. So only, you know, even the best riders in the world lose 90% more than they win. Mm. Wow. You so feel like you are able to learn from those losses um, in, in, in a way that maybe you can't learn from the, the victories? Um, yeah, I think the losses, how you respond to the losses, how you, how a cyclist responds to those periods of darkness and hopelessness and fatigue or injury, illness, um, how a rider responds to those situations basically determines how successful they can be in the sport. And I think that principle applies to life as well. Um, I think it's just more pronounced, uh, more extreme in cycling where the, where the highs and lows are. So, uh, very tangible. Yeah. Yeah. Hmm. How, um, so we, we transition a little, mm -hmm. how did you, you started, you hunted a bunch, you grew up in the outdoors in Virginia. What a great place to grow up. I'm sure, um, for all things outdoors, a lot of interest. How did you get into this, um, you know, finding and capturing, um, not just, uh, not just landscapes, but specifically, um, any kind of a bird, and man, you do it really well. I know you, you're like, I don't know about this moniker of wildlife photographer, but it's a really, a, a really an excellent page. And I really enjoy taking it in because one, where you live, you, you're able to see things that, you know, there, there are birds that I'm not going to get to see because I don't, I don't live where you live or, or get to go to the places. So when you're traveling, do you get to, you know, on maybe a rest day, do you have some time to, to capture some of these birds that you would normally get to see? And like, how did you get to that? Where did, where did that come from? Yeah, definitely. I mean, I can't turn it off. <laughs> it, uh, I'm a little bit embarrassed to admit it, but I am a burger. I, I think I, there's no denying it anymore. All right. Hey, hey I'm, I'm, I'm there with you, man. <laughs> <laughs> um, but it all started from hunting. Um, mm -hmm. I grew up, my parents owned enough property that I could 
I could go hunting almost every day. I was homeschooled until high school. Um, and then even during high school, I would try to get out even for an hour in the morning before school, um, most days. Um, so I spent a lot of time sitting in a tree. Um, and that's been my quiet time. That's been my time meditation. Um, mm -hmm. and still is, um, that's where I'm able to quiet my mind and, and my spirit to a point, um, that I, feel like I'm able to listen to what God has to say to me. Um, mm. I just kind of open myself up to, to anything. And sometimes it doesn't, sometimes it doesn't come right away. Um, especially now with, you know, smartphones and whatever you might have. And it's been mm -hmm. you know, really important to leave that at home. And, you know, cause you sit up there the first day you're, you're kind of twitchy and, for three hours you're sitting there in the silence and um, hoping something walks by, but you start to get bored and twitchy. And um, sometimes it takes a week of sitting three hours a day in silence in nature to actually have any kind of epiphany or um, breakthrough in terms of your thinking or um, even just getting your, getting yourself to a place where you're able to concentrate and listen Mm -hmm. um, yeah. where you're all of the kind of worry and busyness and things that, that just run through your head all the time, your to-do lists uh, just kind of fade away enough that you can start to feel and think more um, and ob observe, observe more what's around you. Um, so I try to be aware of that you know, keep my phone off as much as I can. Um, and as I was sitting out there, you know, I, I would see so many things. Um, that, you know, I, I really only harvest what I intend to eat. Um, and we can only eat so many deer a year. So um, most of the time I'm just sitting up there watching and meditating and listening and praying. Um, so I started bringing a camera with me. Uh, because I would see so many incredible things that I wanted to tell people about. Um, the birding really kicked off on my honeymoon. Um, <laughs> we did a safari. I, I rode for a South African team for two years. Or four, I rode for the team for four years, but the two years. Dimension data? Yeah, so we had our team camp in South Africa and I got married in 2017 and we had our team camp in South Africa that season. And so my wife and I planned our honeymoon to do a safari, uh, the week before our team camp. So wow, we nice. flew over there. Yeah. And we had such an amazing time the first year that we did another one in Kruger the, the following year. Uh, cause it's like, you know, when, when am I going to get an opportunity to come back to Africa? My flight was paid for. Mm -hmm. Um, <laughs> I didn't realize it, that I, I booked a, a guide who was a licensed ornithologist, um, big time birder. And most of the tours that he did were photography tours. Oh, wow. Um, so any time that we weren't looking at a giraffe or a lion or whatever big mammal, um, he's pointing out all these different bird species. And I started keeping a list casually. Um, he would show me, I would take a picture and then write it down and learn about what it was. Uh, and it just got me interested in, in birding. And, you know, I thought that I knew what there was in Virginia, <laughs> you know, cardinals and, blue jays and robins. Um, but when we got home, I started paying more attention to it. And, you know, you see a little Tweety bird fly through the sky. They all kind of look more or less the same. Um, but when you're able to zoom in on it and see the details, you realize how ornate and diverse they are, uh, especially during spring and fall migration. Um, I had no idea what was out there. Um, 
I had seen very few owls. Um, so that was something that intrigued me was trying to get a picture of an owl. And now I feel like I have some incredible photographs of owls um, because I just started looking. And really this Instagram account has kind of evolved into uh, one of my goals with it is to inspire other people to look around and see what there is, right? You know, maybe you don't even have to leave your, your kitchen to have this, this adventure, um, yeah. this sense of exploration and curiosity. You hang a bird feeder in the backyard and you don't know what might show up. That's what's so cool about birds and migration is occasionally something crazy will get blown off track and end up in your backyard. Uh, something that's not supposed to be there. Um, it's, it's amazing what you so, can see whenever you are looking yeah. for it. So I've been keeping track for two years and I've seen, I think my list is like 346 or something now. Wow. Dif different species of birds. And of course that's all over the world. So here in Italy, I'm seeing completely different stuff than I see in Virginia. Right. Um, but I think inspiring that curi that sense of curiosity and, and wonder in other people to, to, to look out their window um, and realize how much there is to see in their own backyard, mm -hmm. that there might be an owl sitting in a tree that you just didn't know about because they're so camouflaged. Mm. We were uh, camping this past weekend in, uh, in Florida and uh, on the trail that goes to the, the beach um, from where our campsite was, we looked up into a tree and there was this enormous nest and in the nest was a, a, a great horned owl. Wow. And, uh, I, it was one of those times where, you know, I, I always, I always hate when I have to say this, but I wish I had my camera, you know, yeah. it was, it was one of those I had purposely left it at home because it, I didn't want to get it messed up. I have a, a decent camera and uh, it can really zoom in there. But it was one of those instances I was kicking myself because I hadn't brought it with me that day. <laughs> yeah, no kidding. I'm kicking you too. I know. <laughs> <laughs> so when you, um, all right, so you've got the, you've got these things that you do and, and, and it all is, is so uh, connected to the outdoors. Um, and, and you're a, you're a, a man of faith also. How does the outdoors help you understand God better? I feel like I'm able to connect with God in the outdoors because it's his creation things operate the way that he, more the way that he intended them to, um, of course, before the fall. But I feel like we live in our manufactured environments, um, staring at our phones and screens all day long, walking around, um, you know, man-made streets and buildings. Um, and certainly there's, there can be beauty in those things as well. But when you get out in nature, you realize how intricately balanced and um, what's the word I'm looking for? I don't know what word I'm looking for. It's just, it just feels like none of this could have happened by chance. Mm. Um, and you see, I don't know, I think, I think beauty in itself is something that uh, the fact that we're able to appreciate it, um, that we can see a sunset or a rainbow um, or a, a mountain um, and the, the way that it moves us, I feel like it, it moves something in us that, that inspires a sense of awe that is reminiscent of what we might feel in the presence of God. Uh, it's a gift from him. Um, 
his creation, something that I believe couldn't have happened by chance, something, I mean, when you look at all of the different species of birds and how um, uniquely formed they are to, to function in a certain way that balances the entire ecosystem, um, it's just shocking and awe-inspiring. Um, there is a C.S. Lewis quote that you're probably familiar with uh, that talks about um, joy. It's a definition, definition of joy. I should have looked it up. You can probably Google it quickly, but it's a, it's a definition of joy as a sense of longing, um, like a, an appetizer, um, an appetizer that kind of whets your, whets your appetite for the feast that is to come. Hmm. That's good. Yeah. You know, you know, we're, we're, making, we were making jokes or you kind of made a joke about, you know, like I, I admit it, I realize that I am a birder and uh, like that's like uh, recently. I'm not, I'm not really ashamed of it. <laughs> it it's all right. It's all right. A, a buddy of mine uh, that's a pastor out in Texas. Um, he was, he was joking about that. His wife was poking fun at him. That he was turning into a bird or whatever. And like, it's like, you know what? it's like what old men do or something. But the more I think about it, the more I think about the, when I look through your feed of all of those different birds and I think about, I, I recently watched an episode of uh, meat eater with Steven Rinella and they were, they were duck hunting. Um, and it was all these different ducks and it was all these, you know, they had to recognize what kind they were really quickly because there are bag limits and all the rules around like, you know, conservation and duck hunting. But like, there were so many different kind and they're so intricate and they're so beautiful that it's like, this is, in, you know, you kind of get overwhelmed at the creativity of who, you know, of God and his ability to make so many variations of something beautiful that, like you said, have very specific purposes that bring balance to the ecosystem. They have a purpose for this and a purpose for that. And, and man, it is, it draws us to worship and it draws us to, to think like uh, what, you know, he says, behold, I'm making all things new. And I think, um, man, there's so much to see. I haven't even seen all things and you're going to make those new. And, and these are a little foretaste of what is to come. That, that's very exciting. And especially when it, when it comes to various birds and like, just in that point, like, how are these going to be made more beautiful? It's incredible. Yeah. I think you hit the nail on the head. I was looking, I was searching for a word and worship is, is it. That's, yeah, it uh, is. that's the sense that you get when you're, you know, I talked, I said all inspiring and whatever other descriptions I use, but I think uh, just a heart of worship is, the perfect way to put it what what you feel when you're out there mm -hmm. and you get to you get a taste of almost what we were made for that's and good when you were saying uh sitting in a tree and and hunting or, or bird watching and and taking leaving your phone away uh it, it made me think I, i'm going through um celebration of discipline right now through uh richard with richard foster and he talks about the uh, the meditation and uh, and how that's a spiritual discipline. And one of the things he says was when, when we meditate on, on God's creation and, and on, and God's, God's word, and, and we create that space, it allows us to have a space in our hearts where God creates a sanctuary. And, and when I think of that, I think, man, there's so many things that are, are distracting me whether it's screens or busyness or all of these things that keep that sanctuary more chaotic than it should be. And so, man, that was a good word to hear from, from you who, 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 who gets that, you know, and, and removing those distractions and allowing that space to be quiet and to be still, you know, even through the antsiness and, you know, just kind of getting, you know, it, it may take a little bit of work, but there's the benefit is of, of creating that quiet space is so important. Uh, I, I think, especially in a, in a day where everything is so immediate and so automatic. Um, I, I don't know. I, I feel, I, I really appreciate you saying that. 
Yeah, absolutely. I mean, like I said, I get so frustrated with myself sometimes because sometimes I'll go into into the woods with something that I want to wrestle with and I, I'm just too distracted. I've got too many, it's just this white noise of all the different things and interactions and um, stuff in my head that I can't turn off. And sometimes it takes, you know, three days of four hours of just sitting in silence and mm. so all that stuff starts to quiet down. Ben, do you think, you know, being immersed in a sport that is all about uh, speed and endurance and going fast, do you think that gives you a greater appreciation for the actual slowing down of being outside? Yes. And I think that's one of the things that's, um, I mean, I've always been probably definitely before cycling, I was drawn to the outdoors and nature and science. Um, before I ever dreamed of being a cyclist, being a national champion, any of this, um, I wanted to be a herpetologist and study reptiles. <laughs> nice. And my buddy that I, you know, talked about this with, and we would go out looking for snakes and frogs and stuff. Um, he actually got his master's in herpetology and works for the government now. Wow. Um, so it's kind of funny. Um, I don't even remember your question. Sorry. I think just going out, do you have an appreciation for the the slowing down of the outdoors versus you yeah. know your, your profession that involves all things full gas? <laughs> exactly. I think it definitely helps balance um, the training and intensity of racing um, to get out, quiet down a little bit. I mean, long training rides alone um, gives you time to, I say it gives you time to think, but to train properly or if you're training properly, like it just creates this, it builds up this fatigue, you know, that it influences, it impacts more than just your physical body. It starts to creep into your mind and even spiritually um, in grand tours, like the tour de France, a three week long race, it breaks you down on so many levels. Um, I, you know, I, I wrote about it in my first tour de France that first it breaks you physically and then it breaks you mentally and then it breaks you spiritually in every way that just breaks you down. Mm. Um, and, you know, in order to prepare for an event like that, you have to train in such a way that also uh, accumulates quite a lot of fatigue. Um, wow. So, you know, I'm not able to access my mind and my sense of creativity as I would like sometimes. And I'm always, you know, reminded in the off season um, when I take a couple of weeks off the bike and it, and it usually takes 10 days to two weeks before one day I wake up and I'm like, Holy cow, I don't need coffee. I have so much energy. Like I'm, I have so much energy that I am like, I don't even want to be around myself. I'm that hyper. Um, and that's when I can start to like, I have all of this creative energy as well. And I want to, you know, I want to start a new project or learn something or build something or whatever it might be. Your wife's like, Ben, you need to, you need to go outside. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, no, she'll, she'll come up with a whole lot of list of things for me to do. <laughs> <laughs> That's, cool. That's awesome. Well, man, we, we always close uh, these conversations by asking what's, uh, you know, what's your next adventure for ever been? Obviously you've got a, a pretty new adventure in uh, the new, a newborn, uh, in your, your, your son, but what's your next adventure? Um, well, I've been responding really well to the training that I've been doing this year. So I am starting to kind of think of different ways that I can challenge myself in training. Um, I kind of, I've been coaching myself as well. Um, and over the last few years, I've really had to concentrate on really holding myself back um, from pushing too deep and digging a hole for myself. But since I'm responding well to everything this year, I want to challenge myself in new ways, um, plan out some kind of route that intimidates me and, and attack it. Um, so there's one adventure. Um, 
yeah, I haven't raced yet since we have had our child. Um, so I think it's, it's not really an exciting challenge, but it will be a challenge to try to do that well, um, to maintain intimacy with my wife and family and the midst of the, this crazy season that is about to start, um, not just cycling season, but like season of life, this, um, traveling, living out of a suitcase, being exhausted and, um, just being on a completely different wavelength from my wife and what she's doing. Um, fortunately she, like I said, understands it very well because of her, um, experience working with the sport, um, and is extremely supportive, but it's challenging for both of us, uh, when I'm traveling. So, sure. um, it's, it's an adventure, um, mm -hmm. but it's, yeah, it's something that is difficult to do well. What's a bucket list bird you want to capture? Oh, um, I mean, I have been chasing owls in Virginia, um, and I do not have a good photo of a great horned owl yet. I have great horned owl and short, short eared owls. Um, I have pictures of them, but they're not, they're not good. There we go. We'll I know, where one, I know where one lives. And he, Brian, right. Brian knows exactly where one lives. <laughs> Coming make down. Come make, down, it down the, make it down to the Gulf Coast. Yeah, I can show you. Well, Ben, what's up? Where can people follow your, your Instagram account? Uh, I post on at BKing137. Um, that's that's your, like your, your cycling account, right? Yeah, so that's where I'm posting. I don't know. Any, anything I'll do on the bike. Um, and then BK nature photo is the wildlife photography, which you won't see any pictures of people on there. there you go. <laughs> we'll make sure to share that in the, in the show notes so people can go follow that. We've really enjoyed, uh, thank you, you know, so much. This, and this, been this good, pop up. Yeah. And this has been a good conversation. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you guys. I appreciate it. Definitely feel free to keep in touch as much as you want. Well, man, well, happy racing brother. And uh, we'll be watching, and uh, we uh, we'll, we'll sh we're looking forward to sharing this conversation, and we're thankful for everybody that does listen. We've been so encouraged by all the messages from from season one, and now season two is rolling. Um, and so, you know, we're thankful for people that leave us a review. And we're you know we're trying to grow it grassroots, and this is you know like your photography is a a hobby. This is our hobby. This is really for fun for us, but we are trying to grow it. So if People will leave us a review, leave us some comments, and share these stories with a friend. And like we always say, we want these stories and conversations to encourage people to write their own stories, to, to reflect and uh, go share their own adventures in the storied outdoors. <laughs>